Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on your lunch break. Uh, we're waiting just a few seconds here to let everyone get connected before we start. Uh, I recognize some familiar names, but I'll go ahead and go over the housekeeping rules just in case we have some new people with us. Um, so you will be on mute during the presentation. However, if you have questions for the presenter or just comments you want to make, um, you can put those in the chat. Um, also, um, you have to accept an uh, agreement that this is being recorded. So that recording will be available uh, afterwards if you'd like to view it um, on the library's YouTube page. And um, so also, if you don't want to appear on the recording, you can turn off your camera. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bob to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much, Bob. Hey, thanks, Vanessa. Well, I guess summer finally arrived. Um, you know, I went out yesterday and sweated all day and working on my garden. And today uh, looks like it's going to be even hotter. So um, one of the things just to remind you of at this time of year is, is your watering, uh, both your landscapes and gardens. And and uh, be you know, mindful of what your hose is doing. Figure out a way to uh, check your hose. I use a timer on my uh, stove or oven so that it doesn't go on forever. And uh, uh, so that's just a reminder on that. But today's growing season uh, presentation is very uh, time uh, appropriate because we're going to have uh, be talking about prepping for vol fall veggies, which is exactly what I did all weekend. Uh, in the heat, it didn't feel like the right time, but we have two growing seasons, as you probably know, at least two in this part of the world. There are many ways to take advantage of it. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to also mention our ongoing partnership uh, with Dallas Public Library and Vanessa and her team the partnership is what makes the programming possible, and we're all very proud of the teamwork. I work for the Office of Environment, Environmentally. I wish they changed the name of the department. The uh, Environmental Quality and Sustainability is one of over 70 departments and divisions, and we focus on the general environment and all things involving it. We focus on topics from air quality to green living to zero waste. And for example, under the topic of green living and air quality, oh, hi there, but Helen. The city council just unanimously approved the first urban forest master plan. And you'll be hearing more about that as we go forward. Today, we're gonna to turn uh, our attention though specifically to the fall garden. Uh, I was looking at my planting calendar and there are some things that you can plant in early August and maybe even late July. And uh, we'll have them growing for the fall. And some of them will be a little later on as we uh, get into the uh, things like cabbages and stuff like that. But the per person today uh, that we're going to welcome back is Jeff Raska. And if you've been around before, Jeff is the Dallas County urban horticulturalist assigned to a &M University AgriLife Extension. And he is a, a fine educator and gardener. He spent 35 years in the horticultural industry, has been teaching 11 years at TAMU. He's a busy guy, lots of fascinating things going on. And his knowledge and experience is always appreciated you know, when we have a chance to have him here. So he's, He's a busy guy. He's the director of the Urban Ag Research Facility uh, and, a master, and the master gardener uh, coordinator, coordinator for Dallas County. So please uh, welcome Jeff Raska and to the virtual podium. And Jeff, you'll take it over. All right. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. I've been working with Bob for quite a few years in the city of Dallas, and it's always a pleasure to work to be able to present for the, for the library systems and work with the city of Dallas. So Bob mentioned a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to, this is a really going to be a broad, broad I'm, subject. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. We're, we're seeing the presenter view of your slideshow. Um, if you're able to swap those um, so that you're streaming the, the other view. How's that? Perfect. That's great. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thank you, buddy. 
so uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about fall gardening and, and getting the garden ready for winter. Although we're a little early thinking about winter, it's it, it's 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 never too early to start getting ready for what you're going to do. And I also want to talk a little bit about spring, talking about planning for spring. And after going through this weather extremes we went through this year, your gardens should look different. They're, my gardens look different. Most of the gardens out in our region look a little different. We lost a few things. We've added a few new things. I think we're going to start looking at different plant, but some some different. Uh, make some additions to our plant palette. So some of the older plants that we used before, i.e. the hawthorns and some of the plants, ligustrum, things like that, that didn't make it through the winter, uh, we probably won't be using them as much if, if, if we're going to look at these kind of weather patterns in the future. So things are changing. It's always good. Gardens should change. Gardens are never, never stay the same. They're always, ecosystems always change. Sustainable gardening, the word sustainable is very subjective to, to the real life, to actual ecosystems and actual nature, because gardens always evolve and they have to evolve and your gardens should evolve, whether it be a landscape beds or your vegetable gardens or fruit trees, whatever you've got out in your, your landscapes, things change and things, you know, for the better sometimes for the worse, but things need to change because that's how ecosystems work. So let's start out talking about what is time, what we can start doing right now in the fall. And we're, we're early fall. We're not into fall yet. I understand, but, Basically, this I'm, I'm talking some of these things we're going to talk about a month away or so before you start doing this. Some of these things you'll you can start doing now. So fall is the best time to plant trees and shrubs by far. All the seasons is the best time to plant. It gives it gives the plants a, a chance to uh, to go through a fall, which they'll do a little rooting when you when plants go into dormant season, go into the fall when it gets cooler after a hot summer. You start losing growth, which they do, and they'll start slowing down their growth. They have two growth spurts. They have a spring spurt, which is the big growth spurt where you, your plants typically flush out. And then you're going to have a fall growth spurt when the weather cools. I do growing, I'll do growing weather is about 65 to 85 degrees for all plants. That's pretty much across the board. Some like a little hotter, some like a little cooler. But typically when your ranges are, you know, 60, 85 you're going to start getting most most of the plant growth. So you kind of kind of judge that between the two seasons we have. Not everybody in the country has two seasons. Most of them have one. Just our region across South Te- across the South and go up to east, up the West Coast has two seasons. So we've kind of we've kind of got a little special uh, kind of a special way we attack the, the our garden projects and our garden seasons. But plant plant trees, plant shrubs. They'll start. Uh, uh, I'll talk about that in a second because I've got another one with this one. But start think about planting trees and shrubs now. Getting close to planting trees and shrubs, You're not quite there. We got to give it at least another month. Generally, Labor Day around September, first of September is when your nurseries will start really uh, stocking up on plants, and that's when you're going to start looking. You'll have all the new fresh plants coming in. You won't you won't be you're, you won't be shopping uh, plants that have been there all summer long and struggle through the summer. Because I know being in I was in part of my my uh, career was in the nursery industry, retail and hotel, wholesale both. And it was a struggle in summer and the plants came out in the, in the summer pretty ratty at times and weren't the best stock. So we'd always get new stock in. So you're getting there about September, start looking for stock, but plant trees, shrubs, neck, you know, when you get them in stock, start thinking about planting them now, make your plans for it. Uh, create your new beds. Now you can certainly build your new beds at any time, but it's a good time to start. And it's a good time to start thinking about next fall. If you, what you're going to do this year, what you want to do next year, there's certainly nothing to matter with with doing a late fall bed if you if you want to wait till it cools down. I know we're we're not in the summer, so let's play like we're in the fall already, and it's cooler. Average high temperatures are back down into the low 90s. And uh, think about when you want to build a bed. If you want to build a fall bed, you're going to build the beds, let them sit all winter, let them set, and then plant plant for spring. That would be ideal. I always like that. I always like to do a late fall bed. I always like to plant them the next spring. I let that bed sit. This is typically for your for your your, your landscape beds, your your small shrubs, your your flowers, your perennials, things like that. Uh, vegetable gardens. Uh, we're I'll talk about vegetables here in a minute when we get down to that point. So vegetables are a little different. But go ahead and build the beds. The picture you see is a research center. That's when we just now putting a research center in. Those are raised beds, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's some of my master gardener team building raised beds in the, the about this time of the year, year and a half ago basically two years ago now and this is when we built the beds and we set the beds in we didn't plant them and we planted the next spring so we we followed that practice it worked out really well uh when fall hit when fall does hit us when fall comes in 
and all your leaves have dropped off, start thinking about cleaning your beds out. If you want to clean your beds out, depending on what you've planted. If I, if I plant, if I plant a more natural system or more natural uh, landscape, it's called a guild, a plant guild. A plant guild is a group of plants in a particular place that basically have the same water needs, the same light needs, the same soil needs, and they are symbiotic. They build a symbiotic relationship through their, uh, through interactions from root systems and through, uh, through what they actually give and take from the soils. So uh, if you want it to be natural and you want to leave your leaves on the ground, it's okay to do that. I've had certainly had really pretty gardens before that I just left the leaves that the leaves just dropped on my deciduous plants. And it's okay that way. Of course, vegetables, things like that. And uh, some of the things you can't do that with, but if you want a more natural, if you want a more natural uh, landscape and your, your landscape design is more, and you lose a lot of natives, then leave them on the ground. Let those, let those go back into the soils. Cause that's kind of the whole point is to, uh, is to uh, naturalize that whole area. So just kind of let them go back if you want to. If it's sometimes big oak trees and lawns and things like that, you're going to have to clean up some leaves, but do not certainly compost the leaves. And I'm not going to talk about composting, but but now's a good time to start thinking about composting because pretty soon in the next, oh, few, three, four months, you're going to have leaves if you've got deciduous trees all over the place. If you've got a lot of big trees, you need to start thinking now, if I don't have a compost system, do I want to put in a compost system? Do I want to find a place to take these leaves besides just putting them to the curb? The worst you used to leave, the worst way we, we treat leaves are putting them on the curb and letting them take them to the trash. They're useless in the dumps. Uh, there's, there's hopefully there's some, I know there's some uh, composting talk to put some composting systems in Dallas and that could come to pass. Hopefully one day there'll be a composting center and that way they could, you can take your leaves and stuff to a composting center and then we can use them to put it back into the soils, which is exactly what it needs to be. But uh, think about a composting system. Think about a composting process now. And uh, it, it'll help us all certainly better for the environment, certainly better for your beds. Nothing better than using your own compost on your on your landscapes and your beds. So think about that. Uh, do not prune yet. We're going to wait till late, late fall before you start dormant pruning. You're going to have to let everything go off. Make sure that your dormant plants are completely are completely uh, empty and, and all, have dropped all their leaves. I don't prune particularly. Uh, I, I just want you to be careful because if you prune too early in the fall, what we don't want is we don't want new growth. Because when you prune that plant, what it's going to want to do is going to want to grow. And we want to make sure that the dormancy, the state of dormancy within that plant is completely dormant, that it has stored its carbohydrates, that it is going to sit there and not going to, Re, replant regrow again so i usually tell people start pruning late fall uh really you'd be better in december going into winter and do this but you can do it in the late fall in some of your plants you can shape your plants a little bit in late fall if you want to shape them if you've got some some plants that they're kind of going unruly and unsightly you can kind of shape them up a little bit but also remember pruning the big thing about pruning is if you're pruning anything that flowers you got to remember when it flowers and what kind of wood it flowers on if i've if i've got a uh, if I've got a uh, really pretty uh, ornamental shrub and it actually blooms on last year's wood or on new or on this year's wood, and I prune it, then I'm pruning off all the wood for next season. So I'm pruning off all the flowers. So be careful. Know exactly when it flowers and when you should prune it. Uh, start once it starts. If you're not going to use your existing leaves and stuff, uh, you can start amending beds once everything's cleared off your dormant plants are out of the way because you want to go through dormancy so you can see what's underneath and you can kind of get it clear bed you want to clean up around it if if you this is this is excluding diseases if you've had diseases in your in your landscapes and had some major disease issues you always have to clean that up most of our diseases especially our fungi are going to translate into a winter sleepover so we want to make sure that we get it all cleaned up. And, and those that's an exception to the rule. If you've got diseases, whatever, you're going to have to keep it clean. Then you're going to mend it every year with fresh starting, fresh mulch. And you mulch it with new mulch being brought in from the outside. You wouldn't want to use your own mulch if it's depending on what it is. You need to, anytime you, if you have disease issues, you certainly need to find out exactly what your issue is and make sure you're treating, treating the right, right disease. Most of our biggest, the biggest mistake that people make in the, in the you know, in their homes they don't identify the right disease. They don't, they don't identify the right insect and we're, you know, they'll go and just start doing treatments and it's not a treatment that actually will affect the, in, the, uh, the infestation or affect the disease. So make sure we know what it is. That's what we're here for at a and that's what we're here for. 
you know, just uh, we're, we're there to help you do that. So make sure you know what you got when you're going with the diseases. And I know I'm getting a little off topic on this at times, but this is kind of this is a very broad subject and there's not a lot of slides into it. So we can kind of scatter shoot this a little bit because fall is what it is. Fall is the plant season. Good time to plant. Good time to make new projects go into place. A good time to evaluate, certainly evaluate your uh, what happened well and what didn't happen so well in your landscape. And uh, falls in, in the late fall, you start thinking about your potted plants. You know, you're going to if you've got big potted plants that do not take the winters, hopefully they're going to be on rollers and you're going to start that process of getting them in and out. If you can play the game of getting them in fall, late fall, going into winter, if you can keep them outside as much as possible, that plant will overwinter a lot better in a garage or, or patio, wherever you're going to put it. But it's in and out. I know it is because some nights it'll, you know, a day will be 75 and a night will be 30. So you, you got to play the game. And But if, the more you can get it outside, the more of the late fall sun energy that plant can absorb, the more the more carbohydrates and sugars it's going to be able to hold over for the winters. And the, the, the quicker it's going to come out and, and next spring when you get it outside again in the weather and the healthier that plant's going to be for the long term and the long term, you know, your long term health on that plant. Plants don't tend to decline. Sometimes potted plants will decline over years. Could be that your pot's not big enough, but a lot of times it's just that the energy has been drained slowly over a period of years going in and out. And uh, you want to make sure and try to keep the plant, let the plant build up as much energy as you can from that late fall sun to be able to store it because he needs a, he needs a good shot to come out winter. And this is also the time coming into it. We start getting our seed catalogs and you start looking at your seeds for next season. And also you'll start looking at your, you, you'll start looking at catalogs or you start looking on the websites for fruit trees and fruiting plants. Typically, if you're doing bare root fruit plants, you're going to order them in, uh, in usually December or, or November, December, and they'll be, they'll deliver them in January, you know, and you'll plant them early January before, before the season. Uh, we'll wake them up before it gets warm and they wake up. We want to plant bare roots when they're completely bare. And that could be roses too, different things you're going to plant. We don't do a lot of roses right now, but things that come in bare root, this is the time when you start ordering them, start looking to order. Them. And I, again, it's a little early. I know it's a little bit early, but think about that's going to be your next thing. If you want to put some fruit trees out, if you want to put some fruiting bushes, if you want to do some uh, some different types of bulbs and some different types of bare root plants, and now's, now's your time when you want to start looking at them. Um, Jeff, um, can I jump in with a question yes. real quick? We got the uh, your speech sure. roses. Um, someone um, said that they lost all their roses to Rose Rosette. Um, uh -huh. did it, do you have a suggestion for something that they could plant in its place? Yeah, you could go through and you can go through and find. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you a couple of plants that would go abelias, uh, spireas, different things that give you flower. Uh, you can go in with, and those are the, those are the non deciduous types. Uh, there's a good plant palette to replace in the roses. You know, absolutely can't put roses back. It, it's, it's, it's done for you right now. And until something drastically happens in, a, in our, uh, in our research, then you just don't, your roses are done and finished off. So there are things, abelias are great. Look at the family, look at the uh, spirea families. There's, there's multiple families uh, for color. There's, there's the Barberry family. There's a lot of different families. I'm going to show you a couple here in a minute on some slides when I talk about plants, some of these things, but you definitely got to go back. It's a great question because you can't go back in with roses because it's, it's a virus and viruses don't go away and the mites don't go away and you're just going to have to reevaluate what you're doing in that bed, but you can do it. You can make just as beautiful bed. I know the Oak, our Oak uh, Cliff Park went to all abelias. They took all the roses out and went to abelias in the park and it's beautiful. There's there's thing about abelia, I mentioned abelia family because there's so many different ones that are that do give you different looks and different color to a point, different variations of colors, but different leaf structures, different different growth structure, different growth patterns. So you can landscape with that family and, and, and get a good diverse look to it. You're gonna want to put other things in it, but if, if you're just replacing a rose bed, you could do like an abelia bed, something like that. So that would be my best suggestion for, for replanting roses to, to redo your roses. So uh, back, back into this. Is that it, Han? Is that the only question? Um, there's some questions about tomatoes. I wasn't sure if you're going to get tomatoes later or. You, we'll, get, we'll get down to it in a minute. Okay. We'll get down to it here in a second. We'll get through there. Um, and someone also asked for recommendations for where to get seeds for the best viability um they've had good and bad bad luck from different seed places okay yeah I, typically i buy all my seeds from either burpees or gurneys 
or local there's some really good local seed you got to you got to there's a there's a misnomer about there's a lot of, of talk about the fact that the seeds didn't germinate very well. well typically most seed companies have good seeds that will germinate uh, something could happen to them in transit in transit they get wet they get humid humidity in them that drops viability uh, just not putting them getting them to not keeping them moist long enough in the ground wherever you're going to do it you, and, and germination inside of you know if you're germinating them in a in a grow tray totally different germinating putting them in germination outside if you plant them directly into the ground uh, there's lots of factors in that that the weather you got to keep them moist the, the big things about all seeds they got to stay moist 24 hours a day with 100 percent humidity until they start breaking loose and that's just that could be underground and moisture in moistness but it's harder to do some seeds naturally will come back that are adapted uh, milkweed's a great example that they're going to come back regardless and some of these seeds will come back regardless cone flower comes back regardless is a really good, pretty viable uh, uh, seed start, but uh, but basically I get them from pretty reputable big companies for the most part. There's I want to support locals if you got local plants. I know the library has a seed bank that they they put together really nice seed bank, so there might be some some availability there. Seeds are viable in the package. I, I know we want to use fresh seeds if we can, but in certain situations, I've worked with, with lots of lots of different people, lots of different groups that just didn't have a lot of money. And so they went to get they went to get uh, uh, you know the best they could for free if they could get free seeds. But I know the 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 uh, library's got a good seed bank. There's native seed companies. You just have to Google native seed companies in their air in Texas, and you've got a lot of good options. But typically, honestly, I buy mine from the bigger companies, and that's just uh, the price is that much difference. But the, the good viability and you know one thing about seeds, real quick, and I'll go through this real fast. Uh, People worry about uh, people worry about uh, doing some some of these seeds coming out of uh, these companies that are hybridized by uh, genetic uh, modifications, GMO. Well, you're not going to be able you're not going to buy a GMO seed. I can promise you that the only GMO seeds on the market would be corn, would be something along the lines of mass produced and be extraordinarily expensive and they're not even available on the market. So it's not going to ever be a GMO issue and GMOs are, I'm not going to get into it, but I don't want you, when you're buying seeds, I don't want that to be a consideration particularly because there's some squash that's GMO, mainly corn, soybean or GMO, but you're not going to plant those anyway in a, in a landscape. You shouldn't be planting any of those in the landscape anyway. They're not viable for a, for a urban ecosystem, but, uh, you know, so don't worry about that and just uh, just start looking at your seed catalog. I know there's more Johnny Seeds is a good seed. There's just a bunch of good ones on, out there. And maybe there's maybe the issue is, you know, if there hasn't been good germination, the issue might be just in the handling of the seed or basically maybe there needs to be a little tweak to how you want to germinate your seeds because they uh, they stay viable for years. I mean, there's been there's been I know the, the longest I think on record was uh, they found a lotus in 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 a. A lotus uh, seed that was in 2,000 year old dwellings that were that they knew they knew a fact how old it was because it had it within the within the uh, in the building that they they excavated and it was 2,000 years old and it actually was viable it actually did did produce a plant so seeds can stay viable a long long time typically I don't want to give them I don't want to have a package seed more than a couple of years if I don't have to but you know they 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 can still be viable so. Uh, look for some of those big companies and go and look at those. But back into this fall planting, uh, what the, what it does for fall for your trees and shrubs, it does give them a chance to sit in the ground in the winter. You got to plant them in fall. They're going to sit there. They'll start a little bit of root growth, hopefully without a lot of top growth. We don't want them to grow tops, but the roots grow during the winter time, so you get some root activity. They'll grow in the ground. They'll get some root stability. They'll go through summer or, or they'll go through the winter. They'll go into a spring where they actually get a good root growth and a good shot of green top. And then when that first summer hits, you've got a really good established root system that's going to be able to handle that first hot summer. We lose a lot of trees in transition from fall to summer just because they're not watered enough or they just don't take off or, or the trees just the, the roots were bound or something like that. But this gives them a good chance to get a good start going into that summer. Summer is the toughest part on them, on the time of season on them. So get it in now if you can. And Plant your plant your trees and shrubs now. Nursery stocks are fresh. I already talked about that. Uh, slow down the store. I talked about that. Plants have gone through their spring growth and flush, and in summer they're slowing down to store energy. The more energy they can store for the winter, 
the better that plant's going to be and the longer history that plant's going to have for you. We want fruit trees. We really want to store fruit energy. We do a lot. We do a lot of different prunings to store fruit energy on our fruit production trees. And uh, they still only live about 20 years at the most. But uh, th there's, re there's reasons why we do the prunes and why we actually want to want uh, to monitor their, their growths and flushes. Whoopsies. It's best time to transplant your whoopsies now. If I planted something in spring and it didn't fit and it got too big, cut it back and transplant now in fall. Lots of whoopsies out there. I've had millions of them over my career, and we all have whoopsies. We all have something we love at the time we put it in when it was a foot around and then goes through a spring, and here it comes out as three foot, four foot wide, and it's taken over some things. You know, it's, it's, it's misbehaved, and it's gone into other people's territory, and you want to plant it somewhere else. But this is the time to do it. Do it at the end of the, the, end of the fall, just about going into in the winter. But you still would like it to be a little viable if you can. But you want to make sure that if it's a dormant, if it's one of those plants that's deciduous, then let the leaves fall and then do transplant. And those will plant all the way through winter. But if it's one that actually holds its leaf, say it's a holly or something, hollies are tough to transplant. But if it is a holly, something like that, then let the leaf stay on it and, and then move it when it's really, really after, you know, once we've got a couple of, of, of uh, frost and freezes, then you can move them and move them around and it'll be okay. Uh, I talked about holding off planting bare roots transplants because you don't want to plant those until January or such. If you're going to do bare roots and bulbs, you can, I know you can go buy bulbs now, but if you buy, buy daffodil bulbs, you know, in September, October, and you, you'll, they'll, that's when they're really going to start being available and you plant them in September, October, November, then they're going to come right up again and you're going to lose all that energy. You don't want to plant them until after Christmas, wait till Christmas, buy them, store them in a dry area, dark area, Wait till after Christmas and then plant them just so long as they don't get wet. They'll store for a long, long time as long as, long as they're not wet. Let them stay dry. Then you want to go ahead and move them or transplant them after Christmas to January. That way, that spring, you'll get a good flush. Because remember, that bulb is all this energy. This is bulbs, corms, everything that you're going to plant underground is a transplant. Rhizome plants, all those are the same thing. That energy is stored for one good flush of growth. And if I if I put it in too early and, I use, and my flush of growth comes up in, in fall, then that it's going to have to go through a whole process to re restore energy again. And it's never going to be as, as viable at next spring. It won't, it won't be as healthy. You need to let this thing go through a dormant stage throughout the winter before it comes up. So plant late. Like, don't plant too easy. Now uh, trees, lots of different wonderful trees. Yes, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, there's a quick question about um, bulbs. Um, how long do they stay viable? You mentioned they stay viable for a, a while. How long do they usually stay viable for? We can, we, can usually, we can usually keep a bulb viable for a season. Usually for one season, if you store it properly, I mean, they ship from, you know, they're, uh, you know, the Danish bulbs are ones that are big shippers that come over here and they're typically shipped three or four months. So they can stay quite, they can stay viable quite a while. I don't know if they're quite available, bulbs are quite available on the market yet. They will be soon though. That's why I wanted to mention them. And you can certainly keep them all winter and, or you can certainly keep them at least till Christmas, January for sure. As long as, again, they got to be, don't let them get wet. Don't let them. Put them in a closet somewhere in a paper bag and don't let them get wet and they should be okay. We just want to, that's, that's all you need to store bulbs. Everything, all the bulbs you get, I know that, I know if you're using certain bulbs, I know they tell you at times you're going to dig them up and put them in the refrigerator. All these bulbs you're going to be buying off the market have already been, all the energy's already stored in there. So you don't need to do any of that to get them started for this first season. Some bulbs you do have to pull up and you do have to put them in a paper bag and you do have to put them in the refrigerator, put them in a cooler unit to, to cool them off and stuff. Uh, those type of bulbs, I typically tell people, if you really love them, use them. But if you don't love that particular plant to death, don't jack with it. Get something else that's not that hard to work with. Use cannas. Use other things that are just come up and go back down again where you don't have to do all that extra work. But if you like it, it, it and you love it, that's fine. It's your landscape. And if you want the work, do the work. But there's a lot of bulbs we don't have to do that with. So. Um, yeah. And someone asked about caladium bulbs. Do you have any experience storing caladium, those? The biggest problem with caladium bulbs is the wet spring or the wet fall. Caladiums do not like to be in wet feet, the bulbs. So when that goes down, so you get, we don't lose them for the coldness. What we lose them for is they get mushy because they just rot in the ground. Caladium bulbs you need to dig up. If you got a group of caladiums, you'll be better off either digging them up, storing them dry, or just replanting every year. That That's the best way with caladiums. They're really not going to be a good viable bulb. I know people can sometimes have it there if they got a really big raised bed they might can pull that off and it's a really well draining bed. Sometimes they'll come back 
in other beds, but it's not, it's not something I would count on every year after year. Most of the time they, they just rot out. So, uh, pull them up. If, you know, once they go dormant in the ground, once you get a good freeze past them, uh, go and pull them up, uh, put them in a, no, don't wash them. Never wash anything coming out of the ground. Leave it, leave it, knock the dirt off, get all the dirt off of it, wipe them off, put them in a bag again and store them in whatever, the, whatever bulb needs to be stored. That could be in a cooler, crisper in your refrigerator. And then again, don't let them get, don't let them get humid though. Don't let humidity get to them. So, but just nice trees here. These are just, I'm just putting through a few trees that are nice that we're using now more and more red buds is small ornamental trees. And some of these are actually the, in our urban landscape, some of these are the top trees. That's our upper canopy trees, oaks and all those things that we used to use all the time, live oaks and, and red oaks things we're, we're backing off of simply because the fact one is oak wilt because they're starting to get oak wilts to through the, the region. The others, they just get too big and, it, and they're not necessary to get that big. These trees can get, Japanese maples will stay pretty small, but blood goods get big, but this is, could be a 20 foot tree, 25 foot tree, and could be an ample big enough for a small backyard in the city. Uh, the bigger trees, this is what we're going to too on some of our trees instead of the big ones. Like I said, the, the live oak and red oak are kind of, we're not using them as much. We're using a little lacy oak which is a wonderful small oak. And then the Monterey oak is, is a lacy oak is more along the lines of the red oak. And then the Monterey oak at the bottom left is more along the lines of the, uh, of the, of the uh, live oak. It's a, it's evergreen, big blue, but it does, it gets about 25 foot tall. It doesn't get as massive. doesn't get as, it's a beautiful tree and it, these are just better off and they don't, they're white oak. So they don't get oak wilt. So we get past the oak wilt issues. Lace bark's always been a pretty tree. And then something like Eason necklaces or one of those, which is a native to Texas, not particularly native to the region, but to Texas. And uh, Chinka Pin Oak's another bigger tree that you like that is native to the region. So there's some good trees, and we're using we're looking at some smaller exceptions. Shrubs, uh, the bill. Here's the bill I talked about replacing the rose. It would be it's an evergreen, so it would stay up, and you got different color flowers and stuff. But you got all kinds. Of, I just threw this in to show you a couple different kind of what we're going in directions. More beauty, you know, we're doing more more wildlife friendly is what we exactly what we want more uh, native to the region or native to texas a lot of these things are native to texas but not native to the region but they do adapt to the region so there's tons of them there's too many in this presentation to go over but these are just some of my favorites hollies so we're not using as many hollies as we used before but we're still using some of the some of the uh, your wax leaves type hollies and certainly your little compact to holly and stuff but hollies you kind of go by the wayside a little bit for some of these ornamental things and the ornamental things do, you know, anything that has flowers and berries and such is a, is a good plant for your ecosystem because it's going to feed your birds, feed your wildlife. It's going to give you insects a place to, to uh, pollinate and also a place to lay their eggs and a place to, to uh, feed uh, perennials, all these different kinds of perennials. Four, my four favorites are probably, well, there's a lot of favorites, but this is probably four easy ones to grow that will come back that you will get some reseeding or you will get some basic Grown, uh, grown from the crown. Uh, perennials are there. This is a good time to start putting these in. Lantanas. I mean, the annuals, of course, going to go off in the thing, but or in the in the winter, they're going to they're going to freeze. But I love Vinca, Penta, Angelonius, Lantanas. New gold Lantanas isn't evergreen for the most part. If it didn't get too cold, then Lantanas can be evergreen or not. But it's a good plant. All these are good plants for for uh, pollinators. Good pollinator plants. So. Uh, veggies and fruit. We'll talk about veggies and fruit. We'll come to the fruit questions right now. Right now, with the very verge of of of, of the the vegetable season, the fall season, we've already gone through spring. And I'll tell you what I've got. We've got a, I've got a we got a farm at our research center. It's a it's a production research farm. We've already harvested all the tomatoes, everything out of the spring. We've cleaned them out. We're about to replant. We're a couple weeks behind this whole year on planting because of the February hit us and February wiped us out the first group, so we had to replant. So we're just about this week. We'll be putting in the second set of tomatoes. We're very we're a couple weeks late on tomatoes. I'm gonna show you the chart, which is a really good chart to go off of. But I want to split this into two different sections. Right now, you're gonna look at either a little bit of fall fruit, which would be tomatoes, could be peppers going in. Peppers you'll get a lot of. Uh, some of the quick set squash maybe to get a lot of, but you want those squashes that come to maturity quickly. And I'll show you that on the chart what I mean. And then your leafy stuff right now, your 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 bro your broccolis, your cauliflowers. You're getting close to this. I mean, we're about the season. I'll show you the chart here about, you know, when the, when the planting ranges are. But we're about the season to start getting these greens in for winter. These greens, all these greens like broccolis and cauliflowers and kales and some of those, some of those really good uh, 
really good greens, excluding lettuces. I don't usually do lettuces or spinach. Both of those come off the board because they're a little bit different. But uh, you can grow them, and if you like them, grow them. But they're, they're uh, little – lettuces are fine but in, in certain applications. But basically all the food we have to grow at the research center has to go into a stew pot. You can't, let it, you can't stew lettuce. So all the th things we grow are basically – lettuce of edible greens like this that go into it but these these actually this is a great time to plant all these because what they're going to do is they'll, they'll come up they'll put a head on uh you will you will and, and when you get your first frosts these things will drop sugar into the heads and it'll be much 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 sweeter and all your leaves will be sweeter they're always going to be sweeter in the fall than they're going to be in the spring when you start harvesting them out just because sugar concentrates a lot heavier in cooler weather so they're going to they're going to sugar themselves up and they're going to be much, much. Uh, they're going to have. A, they're going to carry a, 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 you know, very, very small amount of bitterness to them. So they'll be better in there. Peach trees and, and berry bushes, things like that. All of our fruiting plants. It's going to be, again September. Usually when this comes on, you will see some fruit trees available, and you will start seeing some very plants, of, very, very plants available in the nurseries. And I'm talking, blue, I'm talking blackberries basically. Blueberries don't grow here. You have to grow them in pots. You have to have special. We can grow them here, but I don't want you to grow them here if you've never grown them. I want you to try the other berries first. Uh, grapes are easy enough to grow on vine, but they won't be. You won't find those available. But you, you will find some berries. You will find some fruit trees available now, as long as they're containerized fruit trees, and they look and they'll be coming in fresh again. And you can plant the fruit trees now if you want to plant peaches. Uh, you can generally peaches and uh, pears. Uh, plums, things like that are easier to grow. This is not going to be a, uh, I, I do urban beach production. I do or urban fruit production and that's a long course. But basically, if you're going to choose a couple, the easiest fruit to grow is going to be the blackberry for sure because it's easy to grow. Number two is if you want a tree fruit easy to grow, it's probably going to be the pear. But you're going to have to understand on pears, you're going to have to have a, a pollinizer for that pear. So you're going to have to have two different varieties more than likely. To pollinize the pears. Peach trees are easy enough to grow at times, but they're going to take some manipulation and work, pruning, and some spray schedules if you want peaches without worms in them, because you can't grow peaches. Uh, very rarely can you get peaches without having worms in them, and uh, it's just part of the game, but that's a whole different story. But right now, we're starting to look at, you can find the trees available, you can find some of these fruiting berry plants available. You can plant them now with a well-prepared bed, but just get your beds well-prepared. Here's a plant chart I was talking about. Uh, this shows exactly this. You Google Aggie Hort. It's on here. Uh, it's on the back. It's on the slide in the back. The very last slide has Aggie Hort on it. All you can do is Aggie Hort, A-G-G-I-H-O-R-T slash whatever your topic you want it to be. So it could be Aggie Hort tomatoes. It will pull up all of our tomato information. Aggie Hort vegetable planting guide, which is what this is. It will pull these up for the red. And this is the North Texas region. So this is, was done quite a while back. There are some new varieties on the market, but it's still it's still viable enough to where you can start seeing in general overall. So if you're looking down the line, you look at the first one, asparagus, you don't plant asparagus in fall, so you don't advise planting it. But you start and look at the bush beans. Look at the snap pole beans. I mean, July 30th, August 10th, we're, we're just about past it, but you're not too far past it. You see where your dates are, uh, your beets. Your beets are going to go in September. Again, the September date is going to be important for most, most of these because that's when these, that's when you want to get them in the ground. Broccoli. Uh, you can start getting them in the ground now. Uh, Brussels sprouts now, like I said, those can go in the ground now. Tomatoes, were, if you go down to tomatoes on the second page, we're a couple of weeks off. Uh, past tates, but, but if you're going to do tomatoes now, go find really quick maturities. Maturity is that last, uh, maturity is that second to the last column. It says days to crop maturity. That's how many days you're going to start harvesting the plant so then that's from c coming up so we want to try to get a 50 day tomato or, or 55 day tomato now which could be your cherry tomatoes could be your early girls could be some of those tomatoes that really set fruit quickly and that's pretty much on all the fruit if i want to put melons in now which are kind of off for melons a little bit you want to get the melons that come in a lot quicker you know that, that are come in that are going to be faster you can't do the watermelon at the bottom that's a hundred day melon it will freeze before you'll get to harvest it. So you probably won't get a harvest on it by the time it's matured. But that's a great, this is a great guide to give you a basic guide on, on when to plant, what to plant, planting depths, distance between, and then it's got your average, uh, your, your, your size of the crop. It's also got your dates to go into it. And these dates are still viable. So it's still good dates on here. So this is on here. This is on a website. You can find this easy enough. And this is just some different, different varieties. So you've got your varietal charts and such to go through. So you've kind of got uh, your different types to go. And again, when we're looking at tomatoes, uh, 
Celebrity is a great tomato. It's a seventy day tomato, so it would be the mo- it would be the longest set tomato I would put in right now. Uh, there's some good tomatoes over there. When you're looking at these plants, all the numbers after the celebrity, see those numbers, those letters after celebrity, the more letters, the more disease resistance that plant is. So you want to get a lot of letters on here. Heat waves a nice one to set early, but heat waves one I would plant in spring and not particularly right now, but you can still plant them now. Early girl is VFF. Early girl is probably the one that I want to make that I'd choose if I had a cho- if I had a choice. Early girl, summer girl, one of those quick setting that's around 50, 55 days. Uh, these big old beef steak. We don't really do beef steak tomatoes here anyway. We do the, all the medium sized tomatoes anyway. So this is just kind of a general idea. What was the questions on tomatoes? You said we had a couple questions. Um. Yes. Yeah, so someone mentioned um that they um, were told that if they cut their spring tomatoes by half or a third and water daily, that they would come back in fall. Um, you, can, you, um, you can do that and try it. I've done it for years over and over in different different ways to do it. You can do it. You babysit it through the season as long as you don't get a lot of spider mite issues or a lot of insect issues. You can do that. They will reflower. They're, they're a perennial. They're not an annual plant. So it's, it's not a one and done if the exception is you got to make sure that they're, they're indeterminates. A determinate tomato is only going to set one set of fruit, basically, and it's going to be done. It's going to be finished with its fruit set. So if you get a, to- a determinate tomato, then probably it's not going to reset much fruit. If you got indeterminate, say any of those other types of determinate, whatever you've got, especially heirlooms, uh, heirlooms will set another crop too. So things like that would set another crop. But it really depends. Indeterminate will set a better crop than a determinate will. So, But you can do that. You can do it. And you can babysit them through and water them through the summer. Uh, leave that leaf, cut them, cut them down. Uh, not all the way down. You want to leave leaf on them to be sure they can feed themselves. Uh, don't fertilize right now. Not right now. You don't want you don't want growth or anything too much growth right now because it's too hot. Once it starts cooling down again, when you hit that September, when we hit some cooler weather, bump bump up the fertilizer, get them started again. But again, that kind of also depends on what that tomato was. If it's a 100-day tomato, then you're probably not going to get much crop out of that because it's going to be too late into the season. You know, by the time November hits, you're looking at November, and by the time November hits, your first freeze, you're going to stop the stop. It, once a tomato goes through a freeze, uh, it doesn't always kill the – it'll kill the plant. It doesn't always ruin the tomato, but it will stop the tomato from being able to to finish off. You know, you can pull a tomato pink, or, or once it starts getting a little color on it, pink color or yellow color on it, you can pull them, set them on a counter, and they'll finish off and be fine. But – once it hits a freeze, it won't do that anymore. So fall crops are a little more picky, but you can give it a shot and see, depending on what you got. If you had cherry tomatoes, those were those could do it pretty well. Those would come back pretty well. So give it give it a shot and see. Um, and yeah. someone else asked, is it better to do that or is it better to just plant new plants for the fall? We plant new for the fall. We just we just restart new for the fall. My a lot of research goes into ours on what we're going to do with them too, but basically. Uh, it, because of the summer heat, because it's so many, I mean, we're talking about 400 to 600 tomato plants and the labor it would be intensive to water and the water costs would be intensive. If you're at home, that's a different story. If you're at home with a few tomatoes, that's fine. But on a, on a production farm, you really don't do that. You're really going to replant it. And, and that way you're not wasting too much summer energy and too much summer water on them to get them going there. You're going to have to water them, but it's not going to be near as intensive as trying to keep those big ones together. So we do. Uh- and one more to kind of tangentially tomato related. Um, so someone had some kind of disease in their potted tomatoes. Uh, they think it could be like a bacteria or a mold and they know that they should dispose of the soil and not reuse it next season. But how do they dispose of that soil? Uh, if it's just a pot, if it's in potted plants, I mean, you can, uh, you can take that soil and you could spread it out in a grassy area. If you got a, low, a small a low area in your grass, I don't want to put it really in the bed. I don't want to put it in the compost necessarily, but it won't hurt the turf. If you got turf somewhere where it's a little bit uh, thin in areas, you can spread it out in there. That's not the same bacteriums. Same bacteriums won't attack turf that attack the the vegetables, so it wouldn't be the same thing. You got two different two different uh, invaders there, so you can spread it around there if you want to. I mean, you can bag it and throw it away, but it seems a shame to have to throw it away. And also, you can need to go back and you need to figure out why it had that. Was there too much water? Was it in a too shady location? You know, there's some reason why it had the issue and you need to really pinpoint that issue. So if it comes up, you need to send a, need to get it, send pictures into one of your extension offices and let us look at it to see kind of what that is. So, okay. right. And sorry, one more tomato question came in. Um, 
So if their tomato has blight, but the tomatoes aren't showing mm. any signs, is it safe to eat them? Of course it is. Yeah, blights. I don't worry about blights. I never spray tomatoes. We don't spray tomatoes on the farm anymore. We don't. We don't jack with it because we don't. Uh, the blights are just affect the leaves and the blights coming. You're going to have blights every year. It's a soil borne pathogen and it's going to be an early blight and a late blight and it's going to attack them. Try to keep what you can do. If you just got a few plants, clean the blight areas off, pull off those leaves uh, the best you can just to keep them, to keep some airflow to circulate in there. Cause sometimes blights are going to be worse if you don't have a lot of airflow, but there's not much issue. And in, in, uh, you can certainly eat the tomatoes. That's nothing to do with tomatoes. It's not, it's not anything that translates to human beings. So don't worry about that. Please do eat the tomatoes, enjoy them, and just remember, I'd rather I'd rather have a blight I'd rather have a blighted bush than to spray any kind of insecticide or any kind of fungicide on that bush. It's going to not only kill, won't even kill the blight because the blight's soil borne. You're not going to really kill it, but what it will do, it will kill other fungi that we need in the environment. So you're kind of you're shotgunning and killing a lot of things we need for something that's not going to make any difference. And that's IPM. IPM is Integrated Pest Management. It's the biggest rule about IPM is know when to when to actually have to treat. That's the last thing we want to do. And you got to know when you have to do it. And most of the time we do not need to treat. If I've got a couple of, if I've got okra and I've got a couple of something chewing on an okra leaf, I don't care. It's not going to hurt that okra. That okra is going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Just let it go. I don't care if it's unsightly because we're trying to grow food here. So it doesn't matter as much, but go eat it. Please do eat your tomato. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, so we got about 13 minutes. We'll get through this. We'll be fine. And then there'll be a couple minutes for, for the couple of questions if you want to, but go ahead and ask questions so we can get them through if you want to get a well search plan. If you're going to build a garden, uh, they're only going to be as good as you amend your soil. You got to do soil amendments, obviously. Uh, it's good to always, if I'm going to build a new bed, it's good to build a bed and let them sit in a couple of weeks before I plant them because I want that bed to settle and I want to be able to, to kind of, uh, you know, get that, get the, get the microbes started in the soils and get the, get the environment started where you're going to have all these fungi and microbes and everything that's going to be active in the soils. Uh, always put them by a convenient water supply. I don't, don't think you're going to carry a water hose 500 foot, which is a big mistake for a lot of schools and things I've worked with that didn't have the water supply in place and sun, you're going to have sunny areas. You're going to have shady areas. Just make sure you plant what, you know, plant the plant palette. Plant the pack gill that will fit within the sun requirements you have. And irrigation, always put irrigation in and if you can. You want to irrigate the beds. Uh, drip irrigation is probably the best by far. Well, it is the best by far as far as saving water. But raised bed gardens, best way to go. Um, this is going to be on here, so we're not going to read through these. I don't like to read slides. So this is what it is. Borders can be anything that's non-toxic. So it could be a wood, you know, for anywhere from an animal water trough to wood to rock. Uh, plastic, you know, things like that. Uh, there's lots of different things you can make it out of. As long as you know it's not toxic, it's not going to leach into your vegetable beds, especially. Most of the time, this is actually my kitchen garden at home. So this is my, the raised kitchen garden. But it's uh, easy enough to make. One, the, the rule of thumb is no more, if you're going to make raised beds like this for growing vegetables, no wider than four foot because you never want to step on a raised bed. And, and it can be as long as you want it to be, just no wider than four foot. And at least a foot deep on vegetables, mostly vegetables, at least a foot deep. If I think I'm going to do some root vegetables, so you want to do some deeper rooting, then you want to go you go 18 inches, two foot deep, but at least a foot. That's the general rule for that. A raised bed mix in there. You can make your own mixes, however you want to do it. I use half compost and half a good lo loamy topsoil that you can buy at the home center if you want to get at the home center. Go get their topsoil, half topsoil, half compost, and that's how you can build your beds. You can kill and till your beds. This is going by the way. Tilling is not something we ever do, but I show it because people still want to do it. Uh, you can you can strip the area with a stripper, or, or this is actually you can spray the area if you want to use a herbicide. Uh, you're gonna have, have multiple applications to kill all the grass, strip it all off, and after it's dead, compost with expanded shell, which is up there. Expanded shells are what we use in clay soils. I don't like tilling any. I don't like tilling. I know I haven't tilled myself in years, probably 25, 30 years at least myself. I don't till. So tilling is not the way we go. We build beds up. Even our landscape beds are going to build up and I always put all beds with mulch. But basically the container gardens, containers, you guys we will run through this quickly because this is just containers. Uh, con uh, potting soil for containers always. You don't use garden soils rule of thumb, things like that. Be sure you got to understand that you, your container needs to be big enough to support a, a five foot tomato. If you get one of those big tomatoes, especially an heirloom, 
it could get five foot tall. You have to put a cage in it, but you're going to need a big enough container to put it in to hold it up because it'll fall over and, and be sure your container's big enough, lots of drainage holes on the bottom and make sure that you're going to make sure it's, it's watered all the time because it's going to dry out very quickly. Uh, strip and till, just another way to go. But I don't, again, I don't like the tilling part of it, the stripping the sod, amending the same way, six to eight inches of compost, three inches of expanded chill. If I'm planting into clay, then this is the way, this is why I'm always going to plant into the clay if I'm using my clay soils. We just don't use the soils anymore. We build beds up and we build beds up by different ways. This is lasagna gardening. This is called sheet mulching. This is the way we built the research center. This is the research center being built. Now that whole front end is landscape, but you can see we put out cardboard. We actually put all cardboard on that whole grass. We put, we layered soil and, and mulch and we layered some topsoil and some compost in there to build beds, to build, actually build our beds up. Didn't border these beds. They're just built up raised beds. They're just beds, but they're raised. They're raised a couple foot. Once they got a few rains on them, they dipped down to about a foot and a half. We planted them that next, uh, we waited about six weeks, planted trees, shrubs, things in them. They're wonderful. They're beautiful now in big, large gardens. This is the way to the future. Not only does this raised platform give you present your bed prettier, it gives you a prettier presentation of your, of your landscape. It also will build soil underneath it. It's eco-friendly. We're, we're sequestering our carbon. We're not losing carbon. We're not killing microbes in the soil. That cardboard kills the grass underneath it. It allows this soil to build and work its way down into the into the existing clays as, as it decomposes, and it builds a bed from the top down. All soil in nature, all gar all ecosystems in nature are built from the top down, never from the bottom up. The only thing that comes from the inner earth is the mineral. Mineral is the rock. The mix, that basically means what that soil is going to be. If it's cleaty rock, if it's a white lime rock, you're going to have limey soils. If it's a clay bed, you're going to have the clay base down and bottom, and it's going to be clay soils. If it's sandy loam, you're going to have sandstone, and it's going to be that's your base rock. But that's the underneath. Everything else is built from the top down. So all the organic matter that builds ecosystems, let's build our beds the same way. Why fight this? Why not just build the beds the same way that ecosystem does? We'll go in every year and we'll mulch these beds every year. And then we'll just, that's it. That's all we'll have to do. Now they're, they're maturing in place. So they're done. This is mine at home. This is on the right hand, on the left hand corner. That's, that's irrigation. Use the drip irrigation, the best way to go. Water capture, we're not going to get into that, but rain barrels have a water capture system in your, this is a good time to start thinking about your water capture systems. If you've got some, if gardens are going well and you think, well, this might be a time to, to put in my rain barrels and such, but that's drip irrigation in a bed. You see the drip irrigation goes in before the bed's built and uh, before it's really heavily planted where it's just got a few things planting. Drip irrigation in, uh, in our uh, vegetable bed at the bottom right, but and in pots, you can do it in pots. Something in pots I would do is I would bury that line, come up with your spaghetti tube. And you, run a, you run a supply line down it underground and then you come up the spaghetti tubing up through the holes in the pot you got a drainage hole put that up and bring it in and you'll never see that line so that line doesn't show if you want that to be ornamental in there but kind of a couple more things for fall we're getting close to the end but we're, we're finished we're about done with this so a couple things uh rake it out if you want to rake out we talked about that uh if plants were disease free you can leave it in there or you can take your always compost your leaves if you can except for disease uh, we already talked about that already Pruning, we talked about pruning of uh, flowers, you know, picking out your shrubs, different things you might want to go. Replacing your roses now coming into fall, good time to replace your roses. Uh, I would, for the person who asked about the roses, go back in, reprep your beds a little bit, compost the beds, get them, get them rejuvenated. And the mites that, that cause the, 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 that cause the rosettes, they want to tackle bilia, so or whatever other plants. The only other thing we found in, in minor research is, is beauty berries. Is sometimes that uh, might attack them very rarely, but not not to any kind of substantial. They're really a rose disease, basically. So go back in, clean those beds up right now, get all the debris cleaned out, and you can start replanting, refiguring your beds. Uh, do not prune right now this early, too early, because we want to wait till they're really, really dormant. We already talked about pruning fruit trees across the board. You don't prune fruit trees till you got freezes already past them, so you don't want to worry about that. Uh, Amending beds, mending pots, things like that. Fill up your pots, uh, protect your pots from freezes. Uh, your compost systems, put in your compost systems. You can see the differences. I put those two pictures. That top picture is is mulch. That's a top dressing. The bottom picture is compost. That would be what I'd mix within the soil. I do not mix mulch within the soil because all those big chips need nitrogen to break them down. And if it's going to take nitrogen from the soil that the plants need desperately to get started, 
So you're, 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 you're just defeating a purpose here. So you want to be sure and don't use that as an inside dressing. That is a top dressing. That's the leaves, the sticks, the animal poop, things that die in the forest. That's what that would represent. And then the compost is actually finished compost. You can't really discern what that is anymore. You don't see leaves. You don't see sticks. It's just nice, fluffy, smells wonderful, has a, has a tilthy texture. That's finished compost. That's what I want to mix in. There's the just amendments. I showed you that again. So those are amendments. That's this is before I get this question a lot. So I always put these in on these presentations because people are asking about, you know, they'll, they'll go and they'll get, you can get, you can get tree trimmings from a, from a tree trimming company and use it as a top dressing around trees. As long as you don't dig it into the soil, it will break down. It won't be as, it won't be as nutrient rich yet as it would be if it's like the, the pine bark mulch on the bottom, but you could do it if you needed, if you, if you, if you got it free and you can use it, use it. But don't ever dig that into the soil. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make your plants go yellow. It's going to rob, rob the nitrogen. It's going to slow down your whole garden process. So be sure to not do that. Uh, planning for next spring. It's a great time to start looking at your gardens for next spring. What am I going to do next year? I, I always use my pictures. So this is some of my garden. This is the other end of some of the gardens. And so plan for next spring. Uh, allow for mature growth. Biggest mistake is you plant something, and that's your whoopsies that you're going to have to move because you plant something that's going to get eight foot wide in a four foot space. So either, either re, either rethink your plan get a good plan to begin with, or you're going to have to move that sucker to someplace where it's going to get a chance to grow. So you've got, those are your two options and think about when you're planting, there's, this is no time to go into this, but there's, this is an environmental, this whole garden is an environmental mixture of different types of plants that do different functions in a garden, in an ecosystem. They all give to the ecosystem. They all take something back from the ecosystem, but nothing in here is an advantage. Nothing in here takes and doesn't give different types of leaves, different types of plants. Think about creating an ecosystem. Those can be at a next, you know, we could do like talks on those where we talk about creating ecosystems. I have a talk on plant relationships and ecosystems, things like that. But start looking into that. Start Googling how to create ecosystems. If you can create a complete ecosystem in a garden bed in your backyard, and it doesn't have to be acreage like this one in yours, then you can have a more successful garden. It's going to be a lot more pleasurable for you. You're going to have a lot more uh, wildlife to be able to enjoy in the whole environment. We're going to build an environment here. So if we can build one in, an environment for a neighborhood one yard at a time, and then we start getting communities built in these type of environmental landscapes, and we just stretch it. And the city, I know the city with Bob and the city group is working very hard on this. And we're all trying to do this. you got a lot of people working here, but now it's time for the citizens to step up and start using these practices. You guys did the great step by coming to talks, come to these lectures, come to these talks, and let us try to help you. But but uh, this is a, this is what we want to build in the future there. So that's good. That's the question. So any other questions? Oh, there's lots of questions. <laughs> and, and some okay. requests for some more talks from you, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Ray, uh, do you have a few minutes to stay over, Jeff? Oh, of course I do. I've got all. I've got my, my time is for you guys. I all never right, leave. Awesome. A, I don't want to leave the question. So please, let's get okay. up. Um. So the, someone's making raised beds. Uh, I think you covered this a little bit about what soil to use, and they asked where the best place to purchase it would be too. Okay, you can get it. You can get it prepared soils from a soil company, but you can do just as well going to to a blend, to a nursery or a home center. And you would get their organic compost and you would get their their topsoil, which is typically loamy topsoil, just a bag good, just the bags, 50-50 mix. Always, always start gardens on the bottom. Your bottom layer is always going to be compost. You need a bottom layer of compost to start the process of decomposition at the grass levels. So a layer of compost, a layer of, of topsoil, layer of compost, layer of topsoil to you get your bed field, that's more than adequate. You can buy mixes. Now, now all these home centers and garden centers carry these top, uh, these uh, raised bed mixes, which are good. They're great. They're more expensive, but they are great and they do work. Or a soil company, we we buy it in bulk and we go to to a soil companies and we get their their uh, they have raised bed mixes that we buy that we uh, so we don't have to blend it ourselves. But simplistic enough, it's just going and getting some some topsoil and compost. Start it that way, and as it grows, the first season of of the new raised beds. Any kind of landscape, first season is not going to be near as good as it's going to be because it's got to build it's got to build its its microbe systems, and that soil has to build up all the microbes, all the fungi, everything that's going to need to be a living, sustainable soil web, soil food web is not there yet. It's got to take a season or two. But to build a soil web, you got to have the plants in place. So you got to plant them, 
you got to have the plant roots to feed this to this microbes. You got to have the microbes feed the plant roots. It's, of course, it's all big, wonderful dance, and it's amazing. It's an amazing, uh, uh, artful dance of science and, and the way these plants work and the way these systems work and the soil works. But use that as a as your base, and you'll be you'll be more than happy with that. With that, make it make it as easy as possible. Yes, um, and someone asked um, else asked if it was safe to use cinder blocks for vegetable raised beds. It is now. Cinder blocks used to really contain cinder as their binding agent. They don't contain cinder anymore. So it's, it's one of those recommended. What we do is we, uh, in some of the schools that don't have a lot of money or some of the, the community centers, we take them, turn the holes up and around the holes, you'll plant little annual flowers or you'll plant some perennials in the holes themselves. And then you'll plant your vegetable garden in there. It makes it for pretty, but it also can help bring in some, uh, some pollinizers. Um, and someone else had a question about the bed. So if they have a currently have a layer of mulch on their garden bed, do they need to remove it before they amend your soil for the fall planting? No, no, not ever. Never remove it ever. Just, just add to it, add to it, never remove it. Nothing removes it in the forest. Nothing removes it in an ecosystem. You just keep adding to it. Cause when you add, remember when you add that mulch on top, the layer of mulch that was there, that turns to compost. So within a few you know, depending on weather within a few months or so, that is compost now. So you're basically just rebuilding as you're going. But what's what's great about it is the fact that that old mulch layer will be your next compost layer. And that new mulch layer, the previous, the next season, as you add more mulch, will be your next layer. So never, ever remove it unless there's disease. Again, disease is, is, is a totally different game. So if there's diseases throughout, just keep it clean around the bottom of the plant. Certainly first identify the disease. Make sure it's not make sure it's not a stress related disease that that plant just doesn't do well there. That's what, you know, a lot of times, number one is, is cultural is our main or main issue is culture. Cause the plant wasn't really, it isn't genetically designed to be in that location, too much sun, too much shade, too much water, too much dry, whatever it is, they just don't do well where they're at. And that's something you just got to move the plant. You're never going to solve that with environmental changes in that area, but uh, yeah, never ever move the mulches on there. Just keep it. Um, and then someone commented that they got a drip irrigation kit off of Amazon, but it was terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, poor thing. Uh, but where do you buy your drip irrigation supplies and they, uh, possibly want you to do a future <laughs> drip irrigation class? Yeah, I, I've, I've got, I've got drip irrigation, I've got irrigation lectures too, but I, I get it at, at a professional irrigation supply company, either Ewing or Longhorn or one of those first source of, I use, I don't, I don't hawk. I have nothing to do with these companies, but generally I get it viewing irrigation because they have the supplies in place for professional grade irrigation systems and use a simple irrigation system. Do, do, uh, do look at when you Google things, when you Google certain, any aspect of horticulture, agriculture, whatever, Google, uh, look at extension websites first extension websites are going to be across the country that we do research on all this. Ours is for research and, and nothing we say is not research. Everything we say is in pure science. So it, it's, it's comes from a non agenda area. It comes from a non agenda source. We don't have an agenda. We don't sell you anything. We don't try to go one way over the other. We try to do the best way. And there are, there's multiple ways to grow things. We know that too, but our way of what we research it, we just give you the way we personally research things. And that's what we, that's what we come in when we, uh, when we do our talks and stuff. So use a professional, use a professional grade, uh, go to irrigation supply store. It's EWING is Ewing and they've got, they've got equipment. They got professional equipment in there. Uh, you can, if you're going to go on a website now, there is Netafilm. Netafilm is a very, is probably the best of the best. And you use, you can use their product and their product's really good. But it's not cheap. It's 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 higher, but it's 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 uh, one of the top of the line products. There are really good orbits. A good one, I think, too. Some of them, are, are, I think, I've never used orbit systems, but I've had to orbit clocks and stuff. But irrigation is a whole topic. It really is. It's it's how you're gonna you know charge your irrigation up. You're gonna do battery. You're gonna do solar. You're gonna do electric. Uh, what's your system gonna be there? The big thing about drip systems are if you if you're using an irrigation system, you're trying to trying to change and put some drip drip in it. You got to change the whole zone. You can't, you can't mix zones up. So you'd have to have whole zones. That's a long topic. So, but go to a, uh, go to a professional irrigating supply and let them try to help you through it. And they've, they've got good information for you. 
perfect. Um, we have some plant specific questions here now. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on American smoke tree or the Royal Purple smoke tree? I absolutely love them. One of my favorite trees, one of the top three trees planted across the country. It is a wonderful tree. I've got them in my display. I've got, we got them in a research garden in front of the big rain, uh, the big water capture unit. They're gorgeous. They make a wonderful specimen plant. Uh, very few, very few issues with diseases. Very few issues. That I, insects that are in them are supposed to be in them, but uh, I would use them. You want that deep purple color? That's what I'd use. Nice. Okay. And then someone asked um, if. Um, they can plant Brussels sprouts from seeds right now, and if it, they'd be okay to grow in containers. No, Brussels sprouts are going to have to come from transplants, not from seeds. You're going to have to start. You're going to have to start Brussels plant if if you wanted to ever do seeds on anything. And we didn't get into this, but some plants, uh, most plants that you're going to eat, the leaf, the fruit, uh, the the stock of is going to come from a transplant in our region because we don't have a long growing season short growing seasons I mean, we can't seed out a tomato here in the ground you have to seed it inside six weeks before you plant it so if you want to do brussels sprouts you're going to have to find some and you will i think you'll probably more likely find some coming up within the next after next month uh but you got to plant it from transplants and you, you're not going to be able to do seeds in the ground whatsoever but if you ever want to do seeds six weeks before its plant date you got to get them started inside somewhere and you got to you got to take them through the germination process, and you got to take them through the seedling growth process. Two processes to growing, to propagating seeds. One is the germination; you change it completely, and then you go into a growth phase where you grow your seedlings. But uh, do 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 Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are an interesting plant. Uh, they 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 take a long time to mature, but they can take cold weather, so they can go into the winter. And uh, you got to harvest them from the bottom up to look like a palm tree. You'll take the leaves off as the Brussels sprouts will start growing on the stem itself. Gets a big stem. It looks like a palm tree with little Brussels sprouts going down the palm tree and you harvest them from the ground up. And uh, I love Brussels sprouts, especially fresh ones. When you, when you, when you pick them properly, they're very sweet, especially if you got them in the, well, you're going to have them in the winter. So they're going to be very sweet, but to give it a shot and see Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, transplants, no, no seedlings. Uh, yeah, the only thing you can go f and, and kale. Don't see kale now because it's too. You don't have enough time. Uh, the only thing you would see now would be carrots, beets, uh, radishes, anything that's below ground. You can see now in the ground, or, or within the next week or two, you can get them in the ground, and they'll be for winter. So they'll be a winter crop. But everything else, I'm afraid you're gonna have to do transplants. All right. Uh, and someone asked about squirrels um, eating cone flowers. Uh, they saw a squirrel eating all the squirrels flowers. Squirrels what? Of their, of eating their cone flowers. They had some white cone flowers. Um, and, yeah. and and ate all the flowers. <laughs> is that is that something that they usually eat? <laughs> Well, not particularly usually eat it, but I guess it had some heart condition or something because coneflowers are good for your heart and good for different medical conditions. So it might have had a condition to eat it. Not generally what they'd eat. they generally rather eat everything else in your garden besides that, I would think. But you might have had some tasty coneflowers. Squirrels are one of those things that if you got squirrels everywhere, I, the only advice I can give you is just find you another house, move somewhere. Because you ain't going to get rid of them. And they're, they're not, you know, you can't build a cage over everything. Squirrels are the toughest of the tough. Of everything we deal with, squirrels are probably the toughest of everything. And, uh, they are. They figure I, things out, too. <laughs> yeah. I suggest, yeah. I mean, some people will, you know, take drastic measures and get rid of them. Some people trap them. And, you know, you trapping them is bad because you trap a squirrel. You know, if you trap a squirrel and you move him somewhere else, that squirrel doesn't survive because he's, Squirrels are so territorial within their environments, and usually the squirrel environment is a single family units, uh, extended family units, and a new squirrel coming into that territory is generally killed. So moving them is not the not only not always the most humane thing to do either. So it's hard. Squirrels are tough because squirrels belong here, and we're invading their territories. How it ends up basically because they like to live in our trees and they like to do what we give them. But sometimes if you give them uh, plant some extra things for them, but yeah, it's always a tough one. Tough, tough. <laughs> um, someone really wanted a list of all the plants in that last picture you showed with all the yellow flowers. 
Uh, well, we've got a we've got a uh, Aggie Hort again. You, you do Aggie Hort slash Earthkind Plant Finder or Earthkind Plants. Aggie Hort slash Earthkind Plants, and that will have that's got like 450 different plants on it, and those are in it. And it tells you tells you uh, characteristics, and it's for North Texas region. You'll go into Plant Finder, and it will it will you'll go through the uh, you go through, you'll segment it through till you get to North Texas, North Central Texas, which is our region, and it will give you all these plants, trees, shrubs, flowers, everything that we've tested that goes really that grows really well here. So that's the best. That's a great start for your plant for finding plants because it's all over. We've done it all over the state of Texas over the years, but. There's some, one specifically for our region, and all those are in that plant finder. Every one of them give you good characteristics, give you size and growth, give you water habits, and all that. So, but every, every, anything Aggie Hort, one word, A G G I E H O R T. You see at the top, and then the gardening topic. That's the slide that's still up. Whatever your topic wants to be, it could be a peach, uh, it could be turf, it could be plants, it could be anything we that we research. It will go to that and get you started down that line. And then I use I use I use other websites. I use all oh, oh, these ton of websites, but I use like Oklahoma State, Washington State. I use other Penn State, Cornell. Uh, I use other other websites for a lot of research I do too, because we don't do everything here in Texas. So things that we don't do in Texas, but we could do. Uh, use other use other guides. But just got to be careful on on Doctor Google, because Doctor Google a lot of times that doctor on that other end of it's got an agenda. Or it's got something they're trying to prove or a point they're trying to make. And I'm not trying to make a point. I'm just trying to help you be successful in gardening without destroying the world. That's my main thing is to help everybody have make good crops, certainly feed people is our number one objective, but also for you to enjoy it. Gardening should be enjoyed and it shouldn't be something that you worry about or something that's always a, a hassle or it should be something you enjoy. It's not all fun. Most of it's not fun to me. I don't like digging in holes and things like that. That's nonsense, but you know, it is what you do. You got to do it to get to the end. So, um, and um, someone asked. Uh, speaking of, like, we talked earlier about helping identify plant diseases. Uh, what email address would they send that to? Or um, that could that could come to my address on the slide at the bottom of the slide. If the slide's still up, uh, you've also got you can send it to that help desk, the Master Gardener help desk at two one four nine zero four five zero five three. Number is now remote. So you can send emails to the Master Gardener, Dallas County Master Gardener Help Desk, and it will filter through the system, and, and we will uh, we will help you try to identify what it is. But basically, the bottom uh, the bottom one is my email, so it could come to me too, and I would take a look at. It. But I gotta have pictures, pictures, and then I'm, then you're gonna get a diagnostic questionnaire, basically from me back, because there's always gonna be some things I'll need to ask to see and see what it is. Sometimes if it's environmental, it's hard to judge because uh, you know, it might not be something that's a disease at all or an issue at all, but send that in, you know, send that to me and I'll take a look at it. All right. I think we have one last question here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I lost it now. Um, so have any tips to prevent al algae in rain barrels? Um, there's in the shade, but it, the heat caused, I guess, a lot of algae to bloom. Okay. Well, is, is, is the one thing about rain barrels are make sure they're not see-through, make sure they're, 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 uh, completely dark because that's what happened. Sun got to them somehow. Either they're too either they're opaque -ish and sun got through or the top got sun to it. Algae won't grow in the shade. So uh, if you could paint that rain barrel with something safe paint for it if it's if it's if it's clear. Uh, you you want to make sure one thing about that one thing about rain barrels too is if it's coming off a house, you need a flush everybody needs to put a, a first flush diverter on there. And that simply means that the first water coming off your roof carries leaves down to the pipe that won't go into the barrel. And if you, you used to have a screen on the barrel too, but there's just, if you, if you just Google first flush diverter, make sure you got one of those on there to help your barrel not have any kind of things in it because organics produce algae. So leaves, stick, bird poop, things like that help feed the nitrogen in the water that would produce the algae along with sunshine. And that's what causes algaes. Uh, you don't want to particularly use a, you don't want to use any kind of algicide on it because algicide is a plant killer. So that that's not a great option to it. I'm thinking that somehow it got sun in it. Somehow it's too sunny and you need to shade the area would help. It always, it will really obviously help. 
but you also need to make sure that you're using that water or that barrel. Do not let your rain barrel sit very long. Uh, a rain, 55 gallon rain barrel, we know is not going to have water in, it in the summertime. It's not raining in the summer. So that's not what we're, we're talking about. But the rest of the year that it does rain so much, don't let rain just sit in that barrel. Even though it's raining, I know it's raining and you don't really have to water. At least water your potted plants with it, something else. Keep the water fresh in the barrel. I don't hear that enough, but you need to keep it fresh. You don't need to let it sit there and sit there and sit there and stagnant. You want to make sure that you're using the water out of it. And that's probably my best advice for that. All right. Well, lots of thank yous in the comments, Steph. Uh, we did get one final question in about using plastic bags full of water um, to help get rid of flies. Does that work? Using, using what? I'm sorry. I'm filling up a plastic bag of water and hanging it outside to help deter flies oh i've never heard about that okay uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's a new one to me i know, I, I know there's, lots of, there's lots of there's lots of guides there that one's a new one to me i, I don't know what that would, what a plastic bag would do for flies necessarily i'm not sure if uh you know i'm not sure about that one i know you can you can uh there's lots of things you can do you want to get rid of gnats put a little Put a jar of vinegar out and it's certainly getting that vinegar uh you know and slugs you can put beer out for slugs but i typically don't i'm not gonna waste good beer on slugs that's for sure but uh that one's a new one to me i, I don't have a clue on that one sorry about that oh that's okay well maybe grace can uh she said she's gonna try it out so we'll see um we'll have share to, it. We'll still have some feedback for us on that. absolutely if it works if it works be sure to share it with everybody let everybody know because that might be something to do <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you're always super uh, informative as always. Um, I think everyone would just, just tap into your brain now <laughs> with all your plant knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to help. What's gonna do? Yeah. So we'll definitely. There's definitely a lot of requests to have you come back and speak some more. So I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that. And thank you so much for presenting today. Um, and hopefully everyone will get started on their fall garden and get all their their transplants in and everything, so we, everyone can have some yummy fall and winter vegetables. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure, and thanks for having me on. I always enjoy doing it for the city of Dallas and working with the with the library system and working with y'all. And uh, just let me know how else I can help y'all. Yes, and if um, anybody wants to learn more about urban agriculture um, educational opportunities, um, our next Grow with a session on August second will be um, talking a little bit about that. We'll have someone from um, UNT Dallas and some information um, about the Dallas College Program. So. Please come join us for that if you want to learn more about that. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Did you have anything, Bob or Nedra? No, not at all. Great information. Thank you all for attending. All right. Thank you all so much. Everyone have a wonderful day. Enjoy the. All right. You too. Stay, stay cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being on. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye.